Welcome to the Sports Show. Today, I'm delighted to welcome into the studio one of my sporting heroes. The renowned Paul Trevelyan is a sports artist whose career spans 50 years. He was born in Tottenham, North London, and produced artwork for publications like Eagle Comics and TV Century 21 while still a school pupil. From the 1960s to the 1980s, Trevelyan devised and illustrated pieces for mainstream newspapers like the Daily Mirror, the Daily Express, the Daily Telegraph, and the Times. In 2006, he revived his cult football cartoon, You Are the Ref, which was made famous originally by Shoot magazine during the 1970s. A book collection of 50 years of You Are the Ref was published in October 2006. Paul Trevelyan has met some of the biggest names in sport, including Pele, Bobby Moore, George Best, Franz Beckenbauer, Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, Sugar Ray Robinson, and Oscar De La Hoya. As a very young man, many moons ago, he also met and drew British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, and I'm very impressed with that intro. Unbelievable. You're very welcome. As you can see, it's not easy talking to one of my heroes. Uh, no, it's, it's quite a culture shock having you on the show as well. And as well as that, it's also a very big honor for us to have you here today. Um, I've got a few questions for you, if you don't that's mind. That's good, that's good. Right, going back early on in your life, Paul, when did you first pick up your first pencil? Well, it began when I was in my little um, high chair, when I was a little baby. Uh, was about 18 months, coming up to two years. And my mother discovered I was always playing with the gravy in my plate when I'd finished. And she gave me a piece of bread to mop it up with. But I ate the bread and still carried on playing with the gravy. So she took the plate away and said, look, you've got to stop this. You keep doing it. And then she looked at the plate and she said, that, that looks like a dog. So she called my father over. She said, look, does that look like a dog in the gravy? And he said, well, it, well, it, it could be, but I don't know. Let's just stop and doing it. The next day, my mother took it away very carefully and she said, that's a horse. I'm sure it's a horse. Called my dad over again and said, have a look at it now. Looks like a horse. My dad said, give him a pencil. I got the pencil and I drew the horse. It was the milkman's horse. And then I drew our dog. And from that moment on, I believed, and I still do, it was a magic pencil. It was the pencil that did it. So I went straight to bed put it under my pillow, and to this day, I still sleep with a pencil under my pillow. I still love that pencil. I never had a toy, I never had a teddy bear, I never had a present other than pencils, that's all I wanted, and paper. I wanted to draw, just draw, draw, draw. And that's what I'm doing now, still drawing. Still haven't lost it, still haven't lost that excitement. You haven't, absolutely, and we will have examples of that later on in the show as well. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many modern day parents would actually allow their young children to sleep with a pencil under their pillow, Paul. I mean, <laughs> it's a habit from a bygone era, but you can understand, you know, parents being a bit worried about poking ears and poking eyes and all that. But, um, but that's why it was put yeah. under the pillow. Yes, first, it the... was in my hand. And you... my mum used to say, oh, he got to sleep and he's poking in his eyes. You've got to get it out of his hand. They couldn't. So they said to me, look, well, put, put it under your pillow. It'll be there in the morning. Put it under your pillow. As a compromise. So I put it under the pillow and it was safe there. That's what they... And then as soon as I woke up, I had to get my pencil. Would it still work? Would the pencil still work? I used to run downstairs put it on the paper, it still works. You're my friend, you're my friend, you always do it. Ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -bum. And because I've always done that, done nothing but draw. That's why today I do not do joint up writing. I can hardly read or write. I just draw, draw, draw. I just draw all the time. I can't do joint up writing either. So it's probably hope for me still, Paul. <laughs> right, going back to one of your titles, I mean, you, you know, there's many monikers and titles and nicknames being attributed to your good self. Uh, one that struck me uh, for a very long time, and I always uh, hoped that I would be able to ask you in person one day, why are you known as the master of movement? Well, I'm known as the master of movement because photographs stop the image. If, and, uh, and, and a good example of that, and, and I show this to a lot of people, is Bobby Charlton. And Bobby Charlton, his most famous photograph, everybody knows it, everybody, oh, I've got that photograph, oh, I've got that photograph. They always say that. 
and it shows Bobby with his left foot right up. You just, you can hardly see it. And I looked at that and I thought, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the foot down. Now that is, that is anatomically wrong. I'm using two movements in one drawing. Right. Sometimes I use three movements, get the arm around there. Draw. So that way it moves. Now, I've done that since a little boy because when I used to draw the cat, my mum used to say, you've done four legs. My dad said, no, he's done two cats, one over the other one. I said, no, I, I, it, I, it moves because I saw that little legs. I've always wanted movement. Right. I've movement. The thing has to move. The drawing has to move. So that's why they call me the master of movement. It makes absolute sense now. And obviously being a big fan of your art, I can see exactly how it fits in. Why did you choose to become a sport artist? Well, I was very lucky to be at the Mansion House in 1952. And uh, I was standing in to be an art teacher. I wanted to be an art teacher. I wanted to pass it on. And it was a good excuse when I knew I want a job where I can draw all the time, all the time. So... Uh, I went to the mansion house, I was still at college, and uh, it, the Duke of Edinburgh was handing out the gold medals, and uh, I was very, very happy to be there, and I, and I couldn't believe I was, because I couldn't read, I couldn't write too good, and couldn't spell or anything like that, but I could draw. And I looked around the room, and I saw this all over the England, the UK, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, they've been in this room, and I was there, and... I thought, I must, I must talk to the Duke of Edinburgh. I've got to talk to them. I'm here. I can't let that opportunity go. And I did a sketch of him in the program. I thought, I'd show it to him. And when I got up, someone grabbed my shoulder. What have you been doing? Writing down the speech of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. I said, I didn't write down the speech. I promised I didn't write it down. I can't write. We saw you writing. I said, look, did, did you do that? Yes. You give that to us, we will make sure the Duke of Edinburgh sees it. There's another program, they're fine. And I walked up and I saw the Duke of Edinburgh and I put my hand out. And he put his hand out and he said, yes. And I said, I just wanted to say hello and, and, and how happy I am to be here. He said, what, what do you do? I said, I'm a sports artist. I, I, I work for the local paper and I work for the Lily White uh, Spurs magazine. I, I just draw sports stars. He said, well, next year is the coronation year. You know that? I said, yes, yes, yes. He said, well, coronation ashes. And I knew the Duke of Edinburgh was a good cricketer. I knew that. He said, what do you know about cricket? I said, I, I know a lot. He said, name one or two members of the England team and Australian team. I said, Hutton, Linwall, Miller. He said, that's right, Morris, that's right, Compton, Hutton, Evans. You should make sure you draw them in one of the national papers. I said, that's a big ask. He looked at me and he said, the best advice I've ever had. You must treat every obstacle as a hurdle to be overcome. And from that moment on, I thought, nothing's going to stop me. Every obstacle is going to be a hurdle that I will overcome. And next day, I picked the paper up and I thought, I can't believe it. He says, I've got a letter from the Duke of Edinburgh. I haven't got a letter. What, what did you say I got a letter? And my mum said, it came in the post and we've held it back because it's got Buckingham Palace on it. I opened it up and he said, the Duke of Edinburgh, it really, really does like your picture. It's a splendid drawing. It's in every newspaper. And then every newspaper wanted me to draw for them. The Times, the Telegraph. I'm still at college. They wanted, but they wanted me to draw political people. And I said, no, I've got to do sport. I've sport. got to draw the Coronation Ashes. And they said, no, 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 no. And then the sporting record come in, Clifford Webb. And Clifford Webb said, uh, we'd like you to draw for our paper. And I, I said, can I draw the Coronation Ashes? They said, yes. Whatever you want to draw, you can draw. I said, right. Atten, Limwell, Miller, Compton. It's yes, yes, yes. And I did the whole series, Coronation Ashes. So Royal Command is why I draw sports drawings, and I've done nothing else since. The Royal Command, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. Great advice right from the very top. That's right. Who do you support? 
in football? I support Tottenham. I went there in 1937, so my first match, I was three years old. That was my birthday present. My dad said, when you get to the age of three, you'll understand football. And you can come. It's, a, it's in a FA Cup replay. They're playing Everton. And I, he said, chance to see Dixie Dean. And I, I knew a lot about Dixie Dean because everyone talked about him. And I knew a lot about football. So I, I thought it was on the ground. I wanted to see football kicked about. Boom, boom, boom. But Dixie Dean, when he came out, everybody applauded. All the Spurs fans, everybody, everyone in the ground. This was Dixie. Dixie waved to everybody. I thought, ah. Oh. A great man. And in that match, he scored two goals. Boom, boom. And they were winning 3-1 with five minutes to go. Spurs beat them 4-3. And I come home, my mum said, did you enjoy it? Was it a good birthday present? I said, mum, put Dixie in my scarf. She said, no, no, Spurs player. I said, no, I want Dixie in my scarf. Dixie Dean, he's my hero. I could watch him head a ball. I've never seen anybody head a ball like that. I thought it was on the ground. This man could head a ball from the halfway line. Boom, right out to the wing. He scored two goals. Boom. It's unbelievable. I want Dixie on my scarf. I said, but you're a Spurs supporter. The families, I said, I do support Spurs, but I'm also going to follow Everton. And I forgot everything I could about Dixie Dean. And then 20 years later, I went up to the Liverpool Echo, all the way to Liverpool, and I said, I want to do the life story of Dixie Dean. And they said, you're from London? I said, that's right. What do you know about Dixie Dean? I said, everything. They said, look, Dixie comes in on a Wednesday. Come here next Wednesday. I said, we'll back up to Liverpool. Can I see him today? Look, if you're that keen, next Wednesday. Come back. So I went up there and Dixie came in. And Dixie sat down and I said, Dixie, do you remember this? Do you remember that? And he said, he remembers more. I've forgotten so much. Why was that? I said, I saw you when I was three years old. And from that moment on, when I saw him, as a three-year-old, I saw footballers. They were always 20 foot tall. Giants. Even now, when I see footballers, I mean, Gascoigne was my neighbour. Yes. When I look at them, they're still 20 foot tall. I still see the image as a boy. As a boy. They're still big. They're, they're still, still giants. Big. That's why I draw them. Does art play an important role in sport? Pardon? Art. Does art play an important role in sport? Well, the, I tell you, the, 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 why do they call footballers artists? I'll tell you something here. This is very true. Many people, very few people know this. Footballers are artists. But like when you draw, when I was five years old, I went to London Zoo and I saw an elephant. I said to my dad, will, you, will you take a photograph of the elephant? Oh, because I want to draw him when I go home. I want to draw him. If I draw the, photograph the elephant, I want to go see the lions. And the... He said, you take the photograph. I said, I haven't got a photograph. I haven't got a camera. How could I take the photograph? He said, Paul, that's your camera, your eyes. The eyes are the camera. Do you understand that? They're your eyes. Look at the elephant, then shut your eyes. Can you see the elephant? Mm. Nearly. Well, mm. keep looking. An hour later, my two brothers come back. You missed the lions. You missed the alligators. You missed all the animals. You still been standing here looking at an elephant. But when I come home, I could see the elephant. And from that moment on, it's like in football. You heard... Soon as yesterday on television, what I like about that Tottenham player, that's that new one they got, who, come, who was playing for Milton Keynes, is that he sees the picture. It's like when I met Pele. I said, how good was Bobby Moore? He said, ah, footballers, it's first, you, it's the eyes, then the feet. When you draw, it's the eyes first. You don't draw with the hand. You draw with the eyes. If you can't see it on the paper, you can't draw it. And usually you can't see it on the paper because you never look. People look, but they don't see. They just look. They just look. Bum, bum, bum. Come in here, look around. They wouldn't say, oh, one, two, three, four. Like, You've got to look. Now, Bobby Moore, Pelly said to me, in football, space is only space until you run into it. Now, you see space, and you think, I want that. And you know that Rivellino or Zico is going to see the same space. They're going to put the ball there. So you wait. But when you played against England, when you went, Bobby Moore was already there. He'd seen the space. Now, there's a thing on television uh, about the boys of 66, and it says, Bobby Moore, 96% of his passes were accurate. He made more passes than anybody else in 66 World Cup win. More passes than anybody. And he said, nah, that's not important. 
It's the passes that weren't made. It's the passes that Zico wanted to put into the space and then, huh, more was there. So another, huh, more was there. More was everywhere. Wherever I went, if I saw space, I beat. He was there. He was a man on the spot. He was the best defender that's ever walked on grass. Excellent. I've got a funny one for you. Um, what's this about you once being the world speed kissing champion? Well, I became the world speed kissing champion in America. It was in, it was in Cleveland. And I was with Dennis um, Goodwin and, um, and two other Americans. And um, one of them was a very good golfer. And uh, we went to this um, wonderful nightclub, an unbelievable nightclub. And we knew there was a kissing contest on. And we thought, let's see which of us can pick out the winner. And we looked on the floor and there was about 25 couples. And I'm looking and, we say, and I think that couple can win. I think that couple can win. <laughs> and we're still looking and suddenly um, a girl comes over and she says, and my partner, um, it's the final. And, and I think he's, he's a little nervous, but he doesn't want to compete. And, and I'm ready. I wonder, and she went to the golfer and he said, no, 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 we come to watch. We come, just we're just watching. So they went to the other one. No. And she came to me like, she said, you're going to say no as well, right? I said, no. So I stood up and I said, do you want to win this? She said, yes. Said, Take your shoes off. Take my shoes off? Well, how would that make me win it? I said, you're too tall. We've got to be the same height. Now, what do we do? We hold elbows. She said, that's right, we hold elbows. And then... The toes touch? He said, yes, the toes touch. I said, I've been watching them. And the bodies mustn't touch. I said, great. That's great. Now we've got a good chance. She's got a good figure. Great. We can do it. We can win. Now, for the first 15 minutes, you kiss. Don't touch. Just tap. Don't touch. Don't kiss. Just butterfly. Butterfly. Right? Then the next 15 minutes, I'm going to kiss. She said, I call that cheating. I said, I call it winning. Do you want to win? She said, I want to win. I said, let's do it. So we did it. And we won the title and we got the cup. And she said to me, I can't believe this. So you got I can't to believe take we a trophy won. home as well. Pardon? You got to. No, I didn't get the cup. I left her with the cup. I wasn't that. I didn't want to be the world speed kissing champion. <laughs> so I came back here. I'm happy. <laughs> and then I get a phone call from the BBC television. And they said, We want to do a documentary on the kiss. <laughs> and we want you to defend the title in Birmingham and uh, on Valentine's Day. And I went up to Birmingham. And they said, are you ready to defend it? I said, yeah, I can defend it. And I saw all these young boys and girls. And they said, look at the old guy. Look at the old guys come in. What chance have you got? I said, I'm a champ. They said, come on, you're, you were the champ. Come on, you were the champ. How long ago was that? I said, not that long ago. And I looked at them all and he, and George Siegel, the film star, did the commentary. He was there. And I got the film. And it's been repeated half a dozen times. And I like to look at it. It was an hour-long program. And he, I can hear him say, now look at Trevelyan, he's got the style, he does nothing, he just stands there and bump, bump. And all the others are pecking away, pecking away, their necks are gone, some are too tall, some are bending over. But he didn't think, he didn't use the eyes. And this is why it pays off, why the artists, I knew when I looked at them, and I thought, they got a good chance, because they're both the same height, and, he's, and she's not too um, a booby at the top, so they're not going to touch bodies if they get tired. Um, they got a good chance. They got a good chance. So I knew what to do before I got up, before the girl come over, because I lived through my eyes. In June the nineteen seventies, legendary Don Revy and Leeds United they hired you for an image rebrand. What happened there? Well, what happened at, at uh, I went. I went in, I've, done, I've been in America probably a lot, lot longer than I than, and done a lot more work in America probably than I've done here. And I was in I was in America working for Mark McCormick. Um, with Gary Player, uh, Jack Nicholas, and Arnold Palmer on golf. And I came up with the idea of the Gary Player golf strip, how to play golf. And uh, uh, it was so successful, it was in 1,500 newspapers. So Mark said, look, I want you to work for us in America. So I went over to America, and um, Mark said, this is your room, your studio. And I said, um, I only need one desk. He said, As you've got three desks. He said, yes, that's for three artists. You're not going to draw. You give them up with the ideas, show them what to do, and they'll draw. I said, no, I want to do the drawings. I don't want to do that. He said, no, you're Walt Disney. You're Walt Disney. I'll get out there saying you tell them what to do. You need to come do. on. I said, no, I want to do the drawings. So they said, look, let's talk it over. Um, go and see uh, Jay Lafay. That's in uh, Cleveland. I said, all right. And I thought it was just across the road. 
I tell you, I don't know nothing about geography. I thought Cleveland was just turn the corner, but it was, a, it was an air flight. <laughs> I'd get, I'd be in a local derby over there is 50 miles apart, you know, that, it is, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and I like Cleveland, Ohio, and they took me to see the Cleveland Indians. And when I was walking t to the game, someone gave you a t-shirt, it was a promotional, it was a promotional t-shirt, I know, but I like the image on it. And then you sat down and there's fireworks and there's dancing girls and I can't believe what was going on. And everyone was laughing. It didn't matter what the score was, you were going to come back. You were going to come back. You sat in your seat, they come around with the drinks and the hot dogs. This is the So when I came back, I went straight to Bill Nick, I suppose. I said, Bill, I've got a great idea. I said, we're going to entertain you know. You love entertaining the fans. The fans are the most important. What we're going to do? What, what, what are we going? What, what? You're going to bring American ideas here? I said, Yeah, I've got some ideas I saw in America that will work here. I said, I, I want the players to come out with stocking tags. They haven't done that in America. This is new. Not the stocking tags. It's their number. But before they come out, they sign them, and then they tie them on with their numbers, and then they run around. And at the end of 90 minutes, there's mud on them, there's grass on them, and they take them off and throw them to the kids, throw them to the kids, throw them to the kids. He said, yeah, and what else? I said, I'm going to get target balls. I said, I've seen how they play pool over there. Bum, 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 bum. We're going to get balls with numbers on. Then you, that way, instead of selling one, you sell three. Because if his friend knocks on the door, come out and play football. No, no, no. Okay, got my three footballs. There's number six. There's number two. I've got number eight. I'm going to hit number six with number eight. I'm going to... They can play. They don't need... He said, no, go away. Go and see Don Revy. He needs it. And Don Revy had a bad image. Don Revy was the, it was the uh, it was Dirty Leeds, they were called. Yeah. Which was unfair. The only one was an international. So I went up there and uh, I saw Don. And I said, Don, I've been watching them train. I can't believe what they do, how fit they are. He said, yeah, we work them out. They're the fittest team in the premiership. I said, no, they're so fit. They've got a horse out there that they jump off. They run along, jump up, get on the horse, jump off. I wouldn't jump off that horse. We've had a parachute. I can't believe what they do. He said, so, oh, what are you saying to me? I said, get Les Cocker and we'll choreograph it. Must be Barkley. We do it brilliant. So we did that. And it took them six, nearly six months to get it right. But when they came out, they divided up 12, four in that corner, four in that corner, four in that corner, four in that corner. And he ran around. One, one jumped. They all jumped in the other ones. When they leaped, it was incredible. So in Europe, if you get the book, The Glory Game, Hunter Davis did the book, the biggest selling sports book was ever been. It's about Tottenham that year. And he says, it was like the Nuremberg Rally. There's never been a noise like it in a football ground. That's when the players come running out 15 minutes early. First time ever they came out 15 minutes early. Up until then, they came out three minutes or kickoff. Three minutes. Bill Nickerson came out and thought his watch is stopped. What's going on? They're playing Spurs. I thought, I must get it right. We do it when we play Tottenham so Bill can <laughs> see it. And we knocked them out of the cup that day, 2-1. So, and we went on and won the cup. I told the boys, they win the cup. They said, why should we listen to you? Why should we listen to you? And I said, I'll tell you why you listen to me. You've been in two finals, right? Yes. It's a drawing by Salvador Dali. Yeah, what is it? I said, it's an elephant with long legs. Longest legs you've ever seen. An elephant, longest legs. On his back is an obelisk of weight. And that is expectations, that's the weight. And because he's that good, the elephant, he's just a little afraid. It's that nervous thing, it's that thing in the head, the two voices. One says to you, you can do it. You can knock this penalty in, come on. And the other voice says, you've got to be careful. You're up against Hart, Hart's good. He plays for England. And them two voices argue in your head. And the one that wins the argument decides the result of the puck. Is that the result of the penalty? Is that the result of whatever you're doing, the dart throw? It's the, we've got to win the argument. They told us to the lads. Do you still stand by your comment that Wayne Rooney, the uh, Greta Garbo of football, is better looking than Ronaldo? Wayne Rooney, I saw him uh, about uh, four weeks ago. And I watched him on television. And I could draw Rain, Wayne Rooney with jeans a jacket, and his head down, just like James Dean, is James Dean, is James Dean. James Dean had a squint. So he always looked down a bit funny, and he had a strange face, he like Robert Mitchum. It wasn't, these were, I mean, Humphrey Bogart. He's, I mean, um, Ronaldo is, um, is a plastic perfection. 
Whenever you see Ronaldo, whenever you see him, Colgate <laughs> advert. So that's no good. But when you see Rooney, his head's down when he talks, he talks quietly. If he was in America, they would have took him out of football and put him into films. He would have been the next James Dean. I promise you, he's, a, he's such a good looking boy. He's like Garbo. Garbo, he said, I want to be alone. She didn't go to any big function, any big, never turned. Why, 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 why? Because she photographed so badly. He photographs terrible, Rooney. I've never seen anybody take such a bad photograph. It's been tremendous having you on the show <laughs> today. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for watching The Sports Show.